Hi, my name's Paul and I'm talking to you from the Open Source Satellite Programme where I work for KISS Space Systems. My email address is at the bottom of this slide if you want to get in contact. But today I'm going to be talking about what is it like to be in space, the space environment and spacecraft electronics. Because I think most of us have wondered at some point or another, what is it like to be up there in the ether? We look up at night and, uh, and kind of wonder what it might be like to be up there. Well, let me tell you, it's not very pleasant. It's not very good. Uh, as you probably know, there's no air, which is a bit of a problem if you need to breathe. Um, but also we have this amazing thing in our solar system that we that is a star that we call the sun. And um, the sun looks really nice and lovely when we're here on the ground and we sunbathe and all the rest of it. But actually, um, when you get out from the Earth's atmosphere, that sun, that thermal energy from the sun uh, causes us some big issues on spacecraft because as you travel around the Earth, you go into view of the sun where you get really hot. And then when you go into the shadow of something like the Earth, um, then you become very cold very quickly. And if you know much about sort of mechanical stuff, getting hot and then really cold and then really hot and then really cold can be quite a bit of a problem. Uh, but not only that, it's also a harsh environment because of uh, the sun's solar activity. And there's a science called space weather where we look at this kind of thing. And you can see here uh, in the video at the bottom there, uh, the solar flares from the sun. You can see these kind of like funny little kind of bits coming out of the sun. Uh, and then occasionally we have what's called a coronal mass ejection, which is a big um, sort of expanse of material which comes out of the sun approaching the speed of light so it comes out really really fast and uh, all of these particles shoot out into space and they hit whatever is in their path and the bad news is we are sometimes in that path but the earth has a defense mechanism the defense is the earth's magnetic field which you can sort of see over here the magnetic field of the Earth draws those high energy particles uh, away from harming us as people. But as you can imagine, the higher you get out of the Earth's atmosphere, the more you see the effect of these high energy particles. And in fact, you can even see uh, them in aircraft. And this is a study, the results of a study that, that has been performed by the University of Surrey and my colleague, Dr. Benjamin Kluwer. Uh, and here you can see uh, what basically what Ben is doing. He is giving people little boxes which have kind of radiation monitors in them. Uh, people take them onto their commercial air flights and they sit in the cabin and they they fly around. And all the time this thing is monitoring the amount of radiation dose seen within the aircraft. And you can see here the results. So as you uh, are on the ground waiting to take off, the uh, radiation environment looks fairly sort of benign and not a lot of activity. And then as you take off and you go up into uh, approaching 35,000 feet, you can see that the radiation dose increases and then it goes back down again uh, at the end of the flight. And the interesting thing, it's not even just a function of altitude. Um, latitude and other factors uh, make a difference. So this is a flight from Dubai to London Heathrow. And you can see here um, that despite the fact that the altitude increases quite a bit, again, up to sort of beyond 35,000 feet, uh, you can see the radiation dose isn't really that bad until you get into the northern hemisphere. So, yeah, don't go there. I don't know. Um, but what effect does this have on spacecraft? Well, there are a number of effects because as you go out further from the Earth's atmosphere, the effects of the radiation kind of get worse. So there's um, there's an effect called total ionizing dose. And that's where you have these high energy particles causing gradual degradation to the silicon in the electronics within the spacecraft. And what happens is that those electronic components, they start to draw more and more power over a period of time. And it's kind of a, a slow process. Um, and depending upon the technology and all sorts of things, the amount of shielding and stuff, um, you can um, you can see that the electronics will draw too much power for the uh, spacecraft to deliver. And if you know much about spacecraft design, you'll know that power is at a premium. We haven't got a power station next door. We get all of our solar power from solar panels. So it's very limited. And um, and this can be a problem. It can limit the life of a spacecraft. 
The next problem is kind of uh, slightly more difficult to deal with in a way, and that's called a single event upset. And that's where these high energy particles actually hit the silicon and cause uh, a one to become a zero or a zero to become a one. And if you know much about electronics, then you'll know on computers, then you'll know that really the only things that computers understand are one and zero. You just put lots of them together and then you get something that's kind of a bit more intelligent. Uh, but what computers really cannot cope with is if you flip a one to a zero and a zero to a one uh, when the computer isn't expecting it. And the result of that is kind of unknown. It depends where that happened in, in the memory of the computer. It could have a disastrous effect and it could cause the computer to crash or it might just be something that doesn't really matter too much at all. It depends and it's difficult to predict. And then there's another effect called the multi-bit upset, which is basically the same as an SEU or a single event upset, but it's where the uh, bit flip occurs on more than one bit. It, uh, it, but, it, you know, both SEUs and, and MBUs are non-destructive. They don't cause any permanent damage to the silicon and they're far less, an MBU, a multi-bit upset, is far less likely to happen than an SEU. But the fourth effect is quite difficult to deal with and quite disastrous really a latch up effect or a single event latch up and that's a destructive effect or it can be and that's where um, high energy particles hit certain parts of the silicon causing a short across the power rail to ground uh, and uh, you know that, that means that the uh, electronics starts to draw a lot lot more power and if that's there for um, too long a period of time in under those conditions then it can cause a permanent failure of that piece of electronics and then it's really game over for that computer. So difficult to deal with. So what has the space and the electronics industry done to kind of combat those kind of issues? Well, um, early on uh, with the sort of space industry that, you know, the thought was, right, let's make electronics that are robust against single event upsets and single event latch ups and uh, total ionizing dose radiation. Let's make something that's uh, designed from the ground up to be resilient to that. So that's great. But what we discovered uh, is that, you know, or what we know is that those technologies that employ that kind of technology, um, they are generally uh, quite sort of behind the equivalent commercial sort of uh, technologies that you might find in your mobile phone or in your car or in your washing machine. Uh, and so companies a bit like um, Surrey Satellite Technologies, they decided, right, well, let's just kind of use commercial components, put them in space and see how they behave. And in fact, they found that they behave pretty well in benign sort of um, radiation environments like uh, that you find in low Earth orbit. Um, and in fact, they started to employ uh, commercial components. In particular, they, they use extensively uh, an 8051 microcontroller uh, by, uh, produced by Infineon. And uh, they used it extensively across their spacecraft. It's a commercial component, um, but they needed then to do a mission which uh, was going to be launched into a much higher orbit. And so it, its radiation environment, the radiation it would see would be a lot more kind of a harsh environment. So they decided let's make a functionally equivalent um, computer but it's going to be radiation hardened. And, and, and so you can see here the difference that, you know, making that decision makes because the area of the electronics was a lot higher. The, the, um, the mass was much higher. The component cost was gastronomically higher. Uh, and then also uh, the components that were used were American. So they came under full ITAR export regulation, which means that there's a lot more administration in trying to make use of these components. So what are we trying to do at um, on the open source satellite project? We are trying to use um, commercial components and we're going to test them. We're going to test them in representative environments to check how well they survive um, those um, those four effects. And so we do, we've, made, we've gone about sort of selecting some of the latest technologies and we've gone extensively actually with ARM uh, technology. Uh, ARM technology is used all over the place. It's used in your mobile phone. It's used well in pretty much all mobile phones on the globe. So, you know, and there's a lot of them, you know, as you know. So um, why are they? Why have we chosen them? Well, because because they're, they're, they're used very, very frequently. 
Um, there's not a lot of bugs inside them because so many people are using them. Um, there are lots of open source tools to support the development of software that runs on them. Uh, so that kind of suits our open source stuff. Uh, they're also um, relatively, well, re very high performance per watt of power. Uh, and as I said, you know, uh, in space, we're really worried about power consumption because we, there's not a lot of power to play with. Uh, and so these microprocessors are famed for having um, low power consumption because they make use of a reduced instruction set. So we've chosen the Atmel or microchip SAM V71 uh, ARM microcontroller. It's a high end microcontroller using uh, an ARM M7 Cortex core. And it's got it, it performs 640 million instructions per second. Um, it's got lots of connectivity and stuff. Um, and it also has a floating point unit, which is handy for doing maths to ensure that the spacecraft stays in space. And for the same kind of reason, we, we've selected some other uh, ARM microprocessors, an ARM A5D3, again, Atmel microchip, uh, and then one from ST Microelectronics, uh, an ARM, another ARM Cortex M7, uh, so it's the STM32H7. And this one has the highest performance out of the lot with 1,027 million instructions per second. Again, very low power. And what we found is actually that this particular um, microprocessor really appears to be very easy to work with. There's some really good design environments that come free from uh, ST themselves. Um, actually, both manufacturers uh, produce um, open source tools um, for, uh, for compiling code and, and stuff, both Atmel, Microchip and uh, STM. So what are we going to do? We're going to test these things um, for their uh, tolerance to uh, total ionizing dose initially. And then we have a plan to go and do some testing against the, the effects of single event upsets and or susceptibility to single event upsets and multi-bit upsets and single event latch up. But um, we, we're going to use uh, initially some facilities available from Surrey Space Centre or the University of Surrey. And we've got some funding from Research England through their Sprint program uh, in order to do that. And uh, yeah, and hopefully there will be some further videos where we'll be able to uh, tell you a little bit more about what we're, you know, the process of that radiation testing, the facility at the university. Uh, and then also, because we're doing things open source, we will share the results. Woohoo! Um, so how can you get involved with the Open Source Satellite Project? Well, follow the link up here to register your interest if you want to collaborate. And it just remains to me to say thank you to these collaborators um, and at the University of Surrey and KISP space and uh, in the open source community that we are growing. Uh, thank you very much to all these people who have helped along the way.